I've titled the talk, A SQL Approach to Exploring Elf Objects. It's like the start of an idea I've been pulling on. I'm gonna present some of what I've been working on. I th there, there's a lot more to it, but so this is just like the genesis. I think s I've shown it to a couple people and they either think it's crazy or stupid or awesome. So y you know, you'll have some opinion on it. Um, but uh, you know, please suspend your expectations for a bit. It's a pretty small group, so just ask me questions in the moment if you want. Just raise your hand, I'll take a question. You don't have to wait till the end or anything like that. And if you'd like to reach me after the talk, that's, I have a couple different emails, that's one. Um, I'm also on like X, Twitter, and all that other stuff. But uh, yeah. Okay, just really quickly, who am I? That's a photo of me. I don't know, I have three young boys. I find that important to share. I <laughs> live in California. I'm a s student at uh, UCSC studying computer science. I also work at Google. I'm doing nothing related to this talk at all at Google. And I'm also at scale for NixCon, which was here the last two days. So if you were part of NixCon, whoo! Yeah. I try to, I have quite a lot of long time, but. Okay, so I thought I wanted to start the presentation with like the journey that I'm on and why I want to look at this problem and it's, like I wanted to share a couple insights that are driving my thinking. So these are insights that are basically well known to us all as practitioners of software, but I think some of us maybe have forgotten the scope and, um, s the, and grasp the scope. So these insights are the fundamental, fundamental motivation for my research, specifically for my PhD research, and I wanna bring you along for the journey. So it basically starts with Eric Raymond who published the paper in 1999, where he described two philosophies for producing software, the bizarre model or the cathedral model. So in the bizarre model, development's done kind of in the wild, um, and the cathedral model is done closed source, like um, monolithically. I wanna make the case that the bizarre model has clearly won out against the cathedral model, and we've seen an explosion of packages and open source libraries by authors. So on the left is a graphic of the number of available installations per Linux distribution as of October 2022. So it's a bit old, but it's kind of this driving the same point. And it's from the site repology.com that tracks multiple dis different distributions. On the right is a different metric specifically for Debian, but shows the explosion on a temporal dimension uh, starting from 2004. And you can see the rise of submissions of packages. Basically, I just want to drive the point that there's a lot of software out there. So on the left, Nix packages has over eight, you know, I think right now it's over 80,000 packages installable. And there's about 200,000 submissions for Debian. These are also packages where the authors have gone out and painstakingly modeled their software, put it for installation. So, you know, just there's probably another order of magnitude more of just available so like software out there. Conversely, another data point published by GitHub, as that the which has become like, like the de facto open source uh, place to place your code, is as of 2023, there's 300 million repositories out there, 50 million which are public. So there's like a proliferation of software. This is a garbled mess, and if you can't make sense of it, that's like fine, and that's the point. <laughs> so it's the, um, the build and runtime dependencies for the Ruby interpreter. So I generated this graph with Nix, which pr models exactly all the build uh, dependencies you need. I just wanna convey to you that like software has become immensely complex beyond our understanding and it's like hidden. I picked Ruby because it's actually a very innocuous program. It's available on every distribution. It's written in C. It's has very minimal actually um, dependencies, and yet that small dependency graph is in fact this. So this insight is complexity. So in the last two slides, I showed that there's a huge, the sheer quantity of software has exploded. And maybe not surprisingly, as a result, we're building software that even when perceived to be simple is incredibly complex and, may, and requires many dependencies. The final insight is that although software has gotten more complex and numerous, our ability to specify it, the specificity of it has remained low. As a proxy, here's a graph of all packages in Debian. 
the distribution and how they specify their dependencies. So this is just something I wrote a script to grab and just parsed out like the version semantics and the, the package metadata. So pathic, uh, yeah. Sorry, can you read the question? Let me repeat. Yeah. I don't think that's a million, is it? 100,000. Yeah. This includes maybe library. Okay, yeah. So on this graph, I have about a 100,000. And on a previ previous graph, it showed about much less than that for installable packages for Debian. I don't have a great answer for that right now. Uh, this must include libraries and stuff like that. This just doesn't count as for the other package installable. Yeah. So basically, the, the point driving across in this is three quarters of all packages installed by Debian are unversioned. So the problem has become increasingly complex and having more dependencies, and they're in fact underspecified. You might ask yourself, well, then how does this all work in practice? These packages work because, and really only because, the maintainers of Debian diligently and manually ensure that the full graph of packages in the distribution build, link, and work together. It's an incredibly impressive feat and it requires an immense amount of knowledge about the needs of all these packages. And it's basically in in encoded within this single graph that you can install as, uh, when you use Debian. Interestingly, this cost is actually paid by every distribution out there. You as a user, though, are ultimately locked into a single monolithic package set so that it all makes this possible. So there's three big insights, diversity, complexity, and specificity. You can see from the previous slides that diversity and complexity are inherent to our modern software ecosystem and in tension with specificity. As practitioners, we have to tame the diversity and complexity to do our jobs. But as the Debian package version versioning story shows, it's often too hard to pull off. If we had better tooling to track software metadata, uh, specificity could help us tame that chaos. So that's kind of like the broad guiding theme of my research. So le let's see what I kind of did with that. Okay, where does this complexity come from? I kind of sat and thought about that. And, and at what point is versioning really necessary? So maybe unsurprisingly, I looked at shared libraries, which to me are the most fundamental data management unit in Linux. So shared libraries effectively allow Linux programs to share code. They do this by assigning, by assigning names to chunks of compiled code like functions and global variables. These names are known as symbols. They were invented in the 1960s when disk and bandwidth were at a premium. Back then when it was a benefit to having to upgrade a single file and whether for it was network bandwidth costs or you know, quick security upgrades. Unfortunately, sharing code always creates problems and opportunities for weird disagreements. I included here a nice quote from a, a co-author of mine from a previous paper, which basically says the, the cause and solution to all of life's, life's problems. I mentioned all the nice attributes, albeit outdated for shared objects, but what are these problems his quote's referring to? I believe we've hit an inflection point, and there's now an opportunity to rethink and revisit many primitives in present in today's stack. You don't have to read this quote from Linus. I just wanted to include it. You can't, I don't know if it's totally legible, but uh, it, it's just like, you know, he's known for taking a spicy take on things. This is just one spicy of his many takes on things where he is himself calling out that shared libraries are basically a problem. Uh, th they're unneeded. They're causing way more problems than, th than they solve. Um, specifically in this thread, it was all about performance. So yeah, it's like not a novel idea that I have. And in fact, you know, the originator of Linux also shares the same idea. As a practical example, let me ask you ask, ask this question. Have you ever had a problem installing a Python package? Specifically, have you ever seen this error? That undefined message means that one such symptom of the problems of shared libraries can introduce. Python is taking on the challenge of participating in a large, diverse, and complicated software ecosystem, most of which, which isn't written in Python. That's what makes Python useful and extremely frustrating. I'm not here to solve that issue. And if you're interested in that topic, I hope you attended NixCon yesterday, and because that could be a one hopeful solution. 
These kind of problems make me think of this comic, which although originally intended to poke fun at how some seemingly unknown open source library is keeping the software world afloat, I think fits nicely into this framing as well. I mean, it's a great photo. It fits into like a ton of different framings. But hopefully by this point, my take is you all agree that while software is getting more complex and expansive, it's also suffering from low fidelity. And, th and that's because it's hard to specify what we want and understand what's present and work with the system. The majority of the tools that we've come to use and establish to run and link software and introspect them were devised in the 90s or even earlier. These tool chains associate objects with code at once, so we should really kind of look to that space to figure out how to tame this chaos. I think there's a lot of opportunities to like rife for improvements because they're untouched. We're all focused way higher up in the stack. Okay, so if we're gonna solve problems with symbol resolution, again, the process of finding chunks to satisfy the dependencies at runtime, then we'll need to take control over the sources of information about symbols and the code they refer to. That information is uh, stored in a structure known as ELF, or the executable and linkable format. Shared libraries, relocatable objects, binaries, it's all ELF right now. You know, we're at the Southern California Linux Expo. It won't surprise any of us to hear that I'll be talking about th the rest of this presentation will be focused on ELF. You happen to be on other distributions, like uh, non-Linux. I found that if you squint hard enough, they're actually all the same and they follow the same format. So it's the same. So Mac O, PE, they're eerily similar if you squint at them. ELF has dominated the Linux space since 1999 when it was chosen as the standard. And in fact, as of 2022, Linux kernel 5.18 Drop support for the predecessor, a.out. .out. The ELF object format had like solved a lot of real problems. So we can specify varying ISAs, ABI, byte encodings. It was adapted to be very configurable and adaptable and to support enhan enhancements without breaking compatibility. It's highly configurable and over time though has become more dependent on convention. But basically, <laughs> If you could see the photo, it's a series of like containers. And there's two types of containers, sections or segments, and they're referenced to by name or a pointer in a header table. So it's a very generic format. And then each segment or section has more meaning. Yeah, but it's not by con uh, on the standard. The format's comprised of, like I said, either sections, which is if you use relocatable objects, you'll have that, or segments, which is the executable code such as in a binary. Complicating matters further is ELF files could have both. And there's an overlapping between the two. The granularity categorization of data into named sections by convention, such as uh, is totally by convention. So there's dot text, dot data. That's just like different tool chains have specified that and they've become, co they're convention, but have become law. Uh, so and also like DSS has un uninitialized data, for instance. Conversely, the execution view represented through segments is crafted with a lens though for a performance. So it's, it's tightly packed executable code that can be mapped into process space and then run. The ELF file was designed with trade-offs favoring performance and size. It's evidence from the terseness of the file format. You know, like uh, hex editing the format is uh, very difficult, rife with problems and surprisingly, we do it often. The format also contains a lot of data structures for performance. So it has a hash map, multiple types of hash maps, it has a bloom filter, and some of the other segments have op like uh, different optimized encodings. What is the state of present, of the, what is the state of the art like today, if you wanted to look at your ELF objects? As software system grows in complexity, you'd imagine the tools we rely on to debug and optimize to keep pace. Oddly enough, the landscape of tooling to introspect and work with ELF has seen a consistent reliance on a traditional Unix tools, such as read ELF depicted here, which basically just dumps the raw ASCII representation of the file. These tools have stood the test of time, and one can argue they adhere to the Linux slash Unix philosophy, do one thing well, but it leads to cumbersome commands to extract meaningful answers to questions one may have about data. The status quo for investigating binary data has basically gone unchallenged. 
In an era where data is growing at an unprecedented scale, we've seen software burgeon in size and complexity, there is an impending need to reevaluate our tool set. Performing more advanced analysis on ELF at the moment requires software authors to familiarize themselves with the ELF format because they need to link in like libelf and read it directly. Each tool which seeks to ask questions like nuanced ones about their ELF format have to do so on their own, leveraging at most a library which helps parse the file format. Anecdotally, I found most software that needs data from ELF to choose basically just to shell out instead to read ELF. So you'll have like some software and it just um, spawns a subprocess and does read ELF and greps out the information it needs. There also remains no comprehensive library that supports modification of ELF files. There are targeted tools such as Patch ELF um, that can change the interpreter and a few other things. But so they have pretty restricted editing capabilities and the tool has seen its fair share of bugs from keeping edits in the file consistent. A common meme ag like amongst Unix programmers is that shell scripting, specifically awk, can solve anything. There's a lot of truth to this. In fact, Brian Kennigan's book, The Awk Programming Language, had an implementation of a relational database, an assembler, an interpreter for a toy computer, a graph drawing language, and a recursive descent parser. Okay, so I had to do a lot of work with some ELF files, and that was me. I'm like, oh my God, I'm really sick of elf, like read ELF or obj dump. And while those tools stood the test of time and I can get the information I needed, I was kind of seeing, it felt like a mismatched pairing about techniques that I, like are best practice in the software industry and what we're currently doing today. So the, qu the questioning led me to explore the union of traditional data management principles and binary formats. SQL is the declarative la language lingua franca for databases and its value propositions pretty well understood. Like it decouples understanding how the data is laid out and you can just declaratively de ask what you want. There's an engine, it processes that information and gives you the information you seek. And it leaves the database to apply any optimization techniques when appropriate. This is, oh yeah, I, uh, everyone's mentioning how they have to include AI in their talks. So this was me asking some LLM to generate a logo depicting the Linux Penguin and SQLite. And I had to ask it many different times and this was pretty good actually. So yeah, go AI, I guess. <laughs> okay, so to kind of like test my hypothesis, I said, can I model the schema of ELF in a relational model? This is the most basic schema that I could do at like to start, to port the ELF file to the relational model. I mentioned earlier that ELF was effectively a series of contiguous code or data blocks, and that's what I have. It's nothing like too crazy. It's also not very helpful, but you got your header, you got a content blob and a content blob, and you have many of them. That's what ELF is. And that's kind of what it gives you, and then those contents have more meaning depending on the name, and there's a lot of specialization there. But like as a starting point, they're, isom they're isomorphic. I'll explain what this is. You don't have to read it. It's okay. It's not super legible. But uh, I wanted to show, I th it's like oddly an unexplored space. This is a Google search where I just wrote the term SQL and ELF. I have some generated content up there, some blog posts and a repo that I'll get into in a, sec uh, in a, in a second. Those are the only like top hits. There's a couple more that, I, that are there, but they're actually about SQL Server by Microsoft getting supported on um, Linux. So they talked about SQL Server ported to the ELF file. So it, it came up with SQL and ELF, but other than that, nothing. So when nothing comes up for an idea you're pursuing, I don't know, you're, you're either onto something very wrong or very right. And it just has me thinking about it. Okay, just to cover my bases, I also asked ChatGPT 4.0, okay, so it's the paid model. Have you heard a good about a good tool to do this, to combine SQL and ELF? It came up with nothing, and at best just kept recommending read ELF and obj dump. So AI doesn't know more about this than the rest of us. So for now, our, our jobs are safe. Okay, so this is the repo, oh God. I'll talk about it in a little bit more, but I started to explore this in a utility. It's called SQL Elf. 
It's on GitHub. It's an MIT license, so it's uh, open source. It has a much more complete relational schema for ELF, which will be on the next slide. I can talk about that a little bit. And you can query ELF objects through SQL. It's pip installable right at the moment. It's written in Python, which is a good thing and a bad thing because it's a little bit slow for very, very large binaries. Um, but those are more at the like tail end of some quantiles that I don't I rarely see. And it only supports reading at the moment. I have a plan to try to think through updates. The um, it's a code base, yeah. And shout out to my buddy Mark right there who helped contribute on the project. So the tool offers a schema. It's pretty expansive. It won't fit in one slide. I tried to show just a part of it. It's backed by SQLite. The schema here sh is a partial representation, like I said. And some of the nodal parts missing are I have support for relocations. And Dwarf itself is like a whole other huge mapping of tables that's in um, when you build with debug symbols on it. Right now, I did a pretty one-to-one -one mapping for many of the sections into tables uh, with some minor abstractions to make it a bit easier when you're writing SQL, which I actually find to be a benefit of SQL. So if a particular section is difficult to introspect, SQL lets you just create a logical view, make the, the better abstraction you want to work with, and you jump off from there. I was able, if I found an abstraction common enough I kept needing, so one of them was the string table. I wanted to know the list of strings in my ELF file. Well, I, would, I just made a new view with a new table that had all the list of strings present. So yeah, it's been a pretty fruitful schema. And I don't think it's going to, you know, it, it's evolving. And I'm kind of pulling in more as I discover constant queries I want to do often. I don't know, something got deleted. I, oops. Oh, well. Yeah. Wish I knew it was on that slide. OK. I d how legible is that? I can I'm going to walk through the code, so you don't have to super read it. Uh, they're, they're just examples, and I'm going to talk about some interesting ones. So the rest of this talk now is like five or six anecdotes of like ways I've been using the tool. You want to make you appeal to your senses why you might want to use the tool. So at the top is getting the, above is the relatively simple query to assess whether there are any symbols in the whole dependency closure of the application, which may have been shadowed or interposed, in the com which is uh, the word used in the compiler world. So a shadowed symbol is one where the, uh, there's a symbol exported by two libraries. Most often this is a bug. Unless you're doing LD preload where you're very, very explicit about it, if you've loaded two symbols, sorry, two libraries and they export the same symbol, like you're going to pick one and the one you picked isn't probably the one you intended. Distributions check for this because again, they have a single package set and they need to make sure no symbols interfere. You could be library A and library B and you don't know about each other's code. And if you just happen to pick the same symbol and later on someone des decides to link you both, they're going to have a bad time. So maintainers just like manually audit this and Maybe surprisingly, unsurprisingly, they write ops, ops scripts to just like comb through this and, and test it out. I was able to just write a SQL query. At the moment, it's checking it on a list of binaries. But I'll talk later. You can run this against the whole distribution. So you can encode the question you want as a declarative language question and check the result. On the bottom left is a SQL query from work. Uh, where I work, I did replacing SQL elf in the audit wheel package. So audit wheel, well, Python's packaging story is kind of crazy. Audit wheel is pi part of Python's solution to the problem of how do we distribute compiled code from one machine to an another. Effectively, there's an RFC. The community audited a base set of libraries and symbols present on a commonly used Linux system and deemed those dependencies to be present always. Any other, any other dependency must be included in the Python distribution format itself, which they call a wheel. By not distributing every dependency and relying on some symbols to be present on the machine itself, they then like deem your package to work on most Linuxes. And in Python, they call that many Linux. So you get like this fancy tag. In any case, parts of the code I wanted, we wanted to understand that I was looking at 
if the shared object was a C Python extension and whether it was for Python 2 or 3. So uh, they had like a pretty expansive code block that used whatever Python's equivalent to reading ELF and they would go through the symbol table and check for some symbol and see does it match A or B just to get the answer. Is this extension a Python two, C Python 2 extension, C Python 3? I thought it was nice. I could rewrite that whole thing in a pretty terse SQL statement. I could run it on my command line. I could also, there's a Python API and I, I changed it in an audit wheel and I found it more legible. On the bottom right is the use case that was offered to me from one of my colleagues at Google. They had some tooling that effectively broke when they assumed uh, an invariant, invariant that no two symbols could occupy the same address space within an ELF file. They had to write custom code to check this. Like they hit it once and then it, they had to write a custom binary that would check all their code. You know, like with a declarative language, a new issue comes up. You ha it's, it's a bit more meta. You just write the query you want, and then you add it, and you can check your binaries. And, and that's an equivalent there. One final example is a quick way to find the instructions associated with the given symbol. So I have an instruction table. I added for fun. You could even, like, because it's all lazy SQL, the columns you want, I could disassemble I don't know if I show the, uh, I do show the disassembly as well. So you could just add the disassembler, similar to how kind of objdump and read elf can do. And it, they you only pay for that cost when you see that column. And yeah, so on the left, I use the symbol table itself. And on the right is a demonstration of the tool beginning to use some uh, the dwarfs tables. On the right is like me looking at functions in dwarf and calculating their size. And yeah. Hmm. Okay, so this is me showing. I mostly SQL off works. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't see your hand. Last thing. That's one mode. I'll talk in a second. There's a way like that. That's pretty potentially expensive, and you might want to memoize the results. So it has a mode where it effectively, you know, uh, dumps it out, and then it's much faster. And I have a shitty benchmark that I'll show that shows it's pretty fast. But yeah, it uses SQLite's virtual table to start off uh, functionality, which is a virtual schema. So you could lay a metadata schema uh, schema on top of ELF files and, and access it that way. Cool, so SQL ELF doesn't have to work on one file. SQL ELF. You know, read ELF works on one, and that's a pretty, in, like, limitation. The relational model is all about tuples. So, the, so now we can think about data in terms of that format. The schema easily can handle multiple binaries because I've had this extra column of the path of where the, the binary is from. This nets now lets you think about doing aggregate analysis. Like read elf is only like, let me read this one particular elf file. And now you can think about doing analysis across your whole system be because that's what the relational model gives us. So maybe I wanted to know what is the most used symbol amongst a set of read elf files. Like, you know, I want to do some, I want to think about uh, some sort of like dead code elimination. Oh wow, like in my distribution, no one's ever calling this library. Maybe I should think about removing it. No one's using these symbols. like So you can kind of do this after the fact, ad hoc. What's the most used shared uh, object and so forth? Also, like I had this insight, uh, AR, the Linux format for, it just packages a bunch of like object files when you compile. It's kind of similar. Like th there's a lot of overlap now where y you can have a, mo a schema where you're packing in all these different ELF objects and the AR format's doing that, so yeah, I'll touch on that a little more. Yeah, go ahead. Not you know, yeah, so the question is, in an embedded world, would this help me analyze my symbols? 
being used and figure out which ones to shut out, sh strip out if I'd like, like to, I'd say yes, because an ELF file has to say which symbols are exported, and the another ob shared object file or binary has to say which ones they're importing. So you could get an exhaustive SQL query and say, is anyone, out of all these binaries, did anyone import this symbol? If not, then you know at least it doesn't need to export it. You'd have to know if it's being used within itself, and then yeah. But you could remo remove it from the export set, which really cuts down on the surface, at least, of what people can link against, which is like the, the first step. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you see this as purely like an introspection tool, or do you see like uh, as a like SQL as a way of exposing like an alternative el like binary format that like an interpreter could actually execute? Oh uh, yeah. Okay. So the question. Oh, I guess did I repeat that question? Which was oh, I'll repeat it anyways. Do I see this maybe being purely an introspection tool or replacing Elf itself? I have dreams of the latter. This isn't. I haven't implemented that yet, but like it begs the question, do we need ELF, you know? And I'll talk a little bit, like, there's a need for the performance angle of it, and if we can figure out that trade-off, then maybe we don't need it as well, as much. And, th and that's kind of where I was getting at here, AR, like, there's parts of the tool chain that can co collapse. As soon as you're working in the relational model, it's like, do you need AR? AR is also just a SQLite table, effectively, with many binaries in it, instead of one. Okay, uh, I think two more examples. This is on the top, uh, wait, what's on the bottom? Just dwarf examples, I covered it enough. It's just like, you can go, it's like limitless, so I, I try not to put too much, I just kinda wanted to show some more interesting ones. That one is like, I have the relocations table is on the top, and on the bottom is a, an interesting like static analysis, I wanted to see line count. So dwarf has function symbols, and it maps it to source code lines, so you can kind of do what's the largest program, uh, what's the largest functions amongst a series of binaries or in your binary, so you can get like static analysis in SQL. That's kind of neat, like after the fact, like as long as you compile the debug symbols on it. Okay, so how does this approach like in practice for performance? Well, since the space of possible queries is effectively limitless and SQL Elf can allow arbitrary complex queries. It was pretty tough to do a performance benchmark against, I don't know, read elf. But I chose uh, basically a straightforward example as a proxy and compared it with just doing a single scan. So I have, I chose just list all the symbols. Like, so just one scan query. That was kind of similar to read elf. On the left is a graph where SQL elf is much slower. So it's the green line. The red line is read elf. But interestingly, you can memoize. So I can take that virtual schema and say, well now dump, like dump it, persist it to disk. And then I could access, I could use a C client now, the SQLite C cli client. I don't even have to use my SQL elf tool. I could use the ecosystem of SQLite, which I'll talk to in a second, to access this data. And s maybe unsurprising that it's wicked fast. Like databases are fast. This is like the one billion row challenge and people are writing like crazy optimized code and they're still hitting the same as an engine. It's like a fighter jet. So, and it was pretty easy to persist the data. It's, you can use a CTAS, which is a create table select to effectu effectively memoize the data. And it, it helps me avoid the pitfalls of having it written in Python. Now, how, how problematic are ELF files with symbols on the order of 100,000? It looks, because that's when the graph really kind of spikes up for my SQL elf. I did another audit of a distribution and found, I think there was, you know, I, I normalized it, a very small amount have over 100,000 files. So like on in practice, Linux distributions, it's gonna work surprisingly well. Where it kind of shit the bed was, I tried applying it to some binaries produced at Google, and those were on the order, they were like gigs, huge size files, and it didn't work very well there. But um, you know, for most of us, it's going to be fine for now. And you know, I if I need to, we could rewrite it in some more performant language. Okay, I built another tool. Part of it is just like layering the thing. 
where you give it a Docker image and it produces for that distribution the full final SQL ELF metadata that you can explore. So you run it on individual images. I ran it on De Debian Stable and then Debian Buster. It takes It's pretty quick. So that's now a single SQLite file that has every binary as part of that Docker image. You can then, I don't show that command, but when you file it SQLite, you can attach multiple files and they become like effectively different namespaces. And that secondary qu query, you can kind of see um, the, the two different from statements, the Debian Stable or Debian Buster. So I'm asking the question here, uh, you know, I, Part of the problem is you have to come up with interesting questions. So that sometimes I'm, you know, that's like step two. But this interesting question was, which glibc's aren't present in both? Which glibc version isn't present in both distributions? So that meant if you built your software using some of these symbols with this version, you can't work. It won't work across both Debian distributions. So I thought that was a pretty interesting, quick example to audit. I'm a library author, like. What distributions do I know I'm going to work on? And this is like one way of discovering, well, those distributions have no symbols, like that's their intersection. This is a, another tool. It's written by Simon Wilson. It's called Dataset. You give it SQLite files, and it gives you a really nice visualization to explore the metadata. This was me uploading I th one of those Debian ones to his tool. It, it has a lot. You should really check out the project. It's very, it's really interesting. It's kind of meant for journalists to explore data and build websites. But I have the showcase here is like SQLite's a huge ecosystem itself. So y you get to tap into that instead of having an arc. You know, I was going to use the word archaic, but I'd say ni more. And it's not niche because it's all of Linux's elf. But it's definitely a segmented ecosystem, and coupling with SQLite gives you access to a ton of a ton more tools. And this was an interesting one too. It's like, well, I could just throw a website up. I deployed it with some cloud provider, and you can give it different SQLite files, and instantly start visualizing and navigating with a UI. If writing SQL is not your thing, visualizing the data set. Yeah. I think someone asked a pretty poignant question. It's like, where was I really going with this? I think the kernel seed idea is I'm finding, I'm jumping through hoops to replicate and do what ELF does. And SQLite kind of does it well. And things need to access what all that ELF metadata, the loader, compilers, linkers. A and they're all doing that on their own, individually and in different ways and, and, and trying to counteract performance by adding date like optimization d data structures like they're building their own engines individually to do something like what a, C a database would do so is there you know so I, this is like uh, this sql up to me is like the little seed and i think there's this like bigger broader idea um out there also to pursue all right thank you for the talk i'm happy to take a few more questions <laughs> screen shirt Query or one of the other? Um. Yeah, I, I'm kind of investigating right now. So the question looks like it has some good applications for malware analysis. Have you looked into integrating with OS Query? Definitely, there's a lot of synergy between OS Query and this. OS Query is trying to also put a SQL abstraction onto the rest of your system. And I think what could, it gives you a nice temporal analysis. Like SQL ELF right now is giving you in the moment view of a static file, what's there, and I you know, I'm looking to do it with OS Query to see, well, you could kind of get this analysis over time. And I think that would be the, the dimension OS Query gives you. Um, so yeah, and I think um, it, the more you augment the schema, I think more malware detection analysis could be possible, specifically with the instructions. So right now it's just a pretty simple dump of the, each row is just one instruction. So yeah. Uh, you said, uh, I got the mic. I got the conch. Uh, uh, you said that the different binary formats are kind of similar if you squint. Yeah. Are they similar enough where you could abstract them in the SQL um, schema and then present like a similar interface for you know other operating systems and make it a general purpose tool for for everybody? Is that interesting? Cool. I don't know. Talk. 
Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, they all need symbols. I mean, I've, I've looked at, uh, we've written a little bit about the other formats, specifically Mako and PE, and they all need to encode, they all have code blocks. They all have to define what symbols they need and where to find, and, and what other shared libraries. Uh, that's pretty much it. Yes, sir? And someone's already forked this code and added support. He added a few extra tables, and he added Mako support. It's not unified. So it's like there's the elf tables, and then there's the Mako tables. But the setup had lent itself. It was a very small fork to add. Um, but definitely, I think there's like a unification strategy. Le definitely some of the tables. Part of this is to let you explore elf spe specifics. So you kind of want the specific schema for some of the elf uh, por specific sections. But yeah. Actually, along the same lines, I was wondering, have you looked at Rather than using SQLite, using Postgres as the underlying data store and querying. Yeah, I I, I kind of knew I wanted to head in the direction of maybe replacing Elf. The, the I think the interesting analogy more would be there's DBOS, which is trying to replace all of the database with kind of uh, sorry the operating system with a database access layer. So there's m more synergy there. But to start, I had this breadcrumb idea. Let me lay on. SQL on top of ELF and SQLite is just a little more simpler to work with and then it has a file. So it, the analogy is like you had a file before, you still have a file. If I can execute it and I've just given you SQL introspection, you know, yeah. But th yeah, thank you for the comment. Uh, this question's a bit out of my depth, but uh, SQL I think has roots in data log, which has like more expressive query like uh, syntax especially like recursive queries on data sets did you do any investigation about uh, implementing like a query uh, elf feature like using data log instead of SQL itself like if your performance is a concern and what's sorry what's data log I'm not familiar with it oh it's in SQLite is that what you're saying no data log is like um, it's a query language that predates SQL and like sort of was its progenitor um, and then see, it's like, yeah, it has yeah, prolog and data log. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Um, just want to know if like SQL was a, a constraint for some reason because it's just ubiquitous or if it was a performance. It's more of the like ubiquitousness of it and the lingua franca. Uh, so, yeah, I want to make the tool available to m like many practitioners. And there's, again, it's that ecosystem. Like I also chose SQLite. It's got the ability to share a file is really important and then tap into all the tools to access it. And... I didn't cover it in this slide, but SQLite, I th they publish is the most widely used software on the world. It's on every phone multiple times, and it's on your computer many times. So uh, they have it as like it's uh, on the order of trillion or something like that installable, which is pretty insane. Um, yeah, I, just I would assume that there's a lot of uh, opportunity for like the on disk format to be like efficient for like memory mapping and like stuff of that regard. Um, but I was wondering if you've been following the PVIX. Uh, uh, Nick tree implementation, mm -hmm. which has like a would store all binaries in a few stack storage, um, and then I was thinking like that could provide a like native view SQLite view, even if the underlying uh, storage was perhaps more optimal than the standard SQLite database. Yeah, I've been following Tvix, which is a Nix reimplementation. Not that closely following it, just more like when is it done. And your s what was the first question? Oh, uh, it was more a comment, just like thinking like, uh, could we go beyond SQLite, like the native storage format, which might not be optimized, you know, totally uh, into perhaps having a better on disk representation, but then providing uh, different views into binaries, whether or not it's being used as a executable or being loaded as a. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 looking to just prove. I'm suspending the requirement for performance right now which I know could be a limiting factor for many, but as kind of like a research student, I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> so I'm saying, what if we didn't take that trade off of always picking performance, which always comes with the constraint of like terseness and all that stuff, Wh what do we get out of it? And then if there's a benefit there, try to like add back performance or say, there's probably cases where it's still, you know, you could relax the requirement for performance. And, I, and I've thought through a few ways to add performance. You could always like have an index where you still have the memory like regions contiguous and map them in and still have that um, those sections to explore. 
Did you have a question? I'll take maybe maybe it's the last one. To to return to the original problem statement, people shell out to read elf because parsing elf is uh, painful. Uh, but you're s now shelling out to SQL elf, um, even though you do not love shared object libraries. Uh, have you thought of you know publishing an API so that people could reuse this approach uh, without waiting yet another shell script to that calls a uh, SQL elf. Totally. So it's a Python library. So it's an application as well as a Python library. So if your code's written in Python today, you can use it in your code base uh, fairly trivially. And if you can't, if you're not written in Python, you can at the moment do the step of memoizing it into a SQLite database. And I think every language at the moment has a SQLite client that you could use and access the data that way. So there's definitely very um, good integrations possible without having to shell out. But what I liked is then you can always take that code block and kind of be like, what, what, it's not working. I, I don't know if you guys have all been there and like, it, you don't want to mental map it to something else. And it's great, you know, you're not in the same language, but it is nice to be able to copy that block on your terminal kind of continue your investigation and then go back. So it's definitely a little bit of trade-off, but yeah, integrations with languages is very possible right now. All right, thank you everyone. <laughs>